Hey everybody, it's Terry here with the local offline collaboration call on April 15th. Um, we're psyched today. Jim is going to give us a look at the research he's been doing into IPFS and peer-to-peer -peer on mobile, which should be really exciting. Um, but before we do that, let's do just a quick go around because there are a couple of new faces so we can just super quickly introduce who we are and what we're excited about or working on in this sort of offline local collaboration space. So I can get us started. My name is Terry Chadbourne. I work at Protocol Labs running the Proto School project. Um, but I am also someone who's been running Offline Camp, which is an event for people interested in offline first generally, not specifically DWeb. So that's where, where my background is in this space. I'm going to go this way on my screen. So Diedrich, you're up. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, I work on the IPFS project, uh, doing browser integrations, uh, ecosystem work, working with a lot of the collaboration partners and uh, some of the folks here on this call. I've been working with uh, Jim uh, earlier. You may have seen in the year of the IPFS Weekly, the browser design guidelines presentation. Uh, that was work that uh, Jim did on the, uh, his first IPFS dev grant. And, and now this one, moving on to a broader area, uh, looking at IPFS on mobile generally, uh, both best practices, ways that people are building now, constraints, and also into the attitudes of, uh, of more advanced users, but also beginner users. So excited to see this research, see the light of the day. Thank you. Lytle, you're next on my screen. Uh, yeah, it's me. Uh, I'm working on IPFS uh, and the space when IPFS is uh, creeping into web browsers. Uh, really excited about uh, work uh, Jim is uh, doing bit for uh, starting discussion about how do we start thinking about content addressing in the address bar when you don't specify the source and you can get data in an offline environment so it's a really exciting space for me awesome Molly Hi, um, I also work on IPFS and I'm always very excited about the local offline collaboration space from an educational perspective and um, just in general, allowing people to use tools resiliently without any sort of central connectivity to um, people who are hosting your data or relaying your traffic. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to, to hear what Jim has come up with. I'm very excited about the, the mobile work that's being done in the IPFS space, the work that Birdie's doing, Textile, Three Box, a number of other groups. So excited to see how this will inform their trajectories forward. Awesome. Nico? Hi, thank you for the invitation, Terry. Uh, my name is Nico. I am part of uh, two organizations that are related with the D web but not directly connected. Uh, one is uh, Alter Mundi, who is building the Libre router that uh, helps con uh, communities that are currently unconnected connect themselves. We know that half of the population in the world is unconnected, and the D web uh, tools will be one vehicle potentially. So I am looking for that connection in between what Jim has produced and what the uh, not only the unconnected, but also the less privileged people in the planet uh, can get out of uh, uh, his research and the collaborations that can come out of. And also, I'm part of the Association for Progressive Communications, and during this year, I'm going to be working on uh, strengthening foundational technologies for community networks. Uh, for us, foundational technologies would be those technologies that community networks will rely on to uh, grow stronger and, and, uh, and more re resiliently uh, and uh, we will be working on uh, mechanisms to support community networks in detecting these technologies which ones are useful for them and how they can leverage them and also on the technology side how we can support technologists and technology teams uh, in, uh, that community networks are relying on uh, to have better plans have more resiliency, sustainability in their own projects. Awesome. And for those who haven't joined us before, if you scroll back in the meeting notes, you'll find presentations from Nico on cool peer-to-peer -peer community resilient network kind of work he's been doing. So there's great stuff in there. Uh, Giannis, you're up. 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Yanis. Um, I work at Cold Labs as a, a research scientist and um, yeah, local offline communications uh, have been a very nice topic. I've been investigating for many, many years and I'm um, yeah, looking forward to listening to new developments in this and other calls. Yeah. Great. Uh, Aaron? Hey, um, yeah, I'm Aaron Satula. I work at Textile. Uh, really excited to kind of learn more about this group. Um, we've been working on mobile related IPFS stuff for a while here and um, kind of with the newest version of our technology are really trying to like rethink what the best way to integrate uh, into mobile is. So really excited to learn from you all. Very cool, and Jim? Yeah, I'm Jim Kosum. I'm a designer, researcher, or uh, and I've been, as Dietrich mentioned before, I worked previously on the browser design guidelines, uh, which is also research in a design phase to establish, yeah, like Lido said before, kind of how IPFS would work natively in a browser for users. And then now uh, I've concluded the research end of the IPFS mobile guidelines, which is um, yeah, yeah what, what you'll see in a minute, basically. <laughs> So, I'm on mute. Thank you, Zoom, okay, for telling me I was on mute. That was helpful. Um, so for today on our agenda, we have that presentation by Jim, and then we'll have some time for questions to talk more about that. And then I also put on the agenda to do some brainstorming for future topics we'd like to cover on this monthly call, uh -huh. so we can start thinking through some speakers and what we'd like to do moving forward. So Jim, I'll let you dig in. Feel free to sure. share your screen if you have anything you want to show us. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, right. Okay. Can you all see uh, Firefox there with yeah. a thing that says IPFS browser design guidelines in there? Right. And hopefully you don't see uh, anything else, but, uh, which I don't think you should do. Um, right. So um, yeah. So. Uh, sorry, one second. Yeah, so uh, basically, we're looking at how to uh, how to expand IPFS in uh, the thinking around it into mobile, like we mentioned before, um, and and we wanted to look at how we would involve users. And these guidelines will kind of bridge the user needs discovered in the research, and then help that in, in building out IPFS in particular in mobile. Um, in terms of, uh, they would help unify thinking and best practices. Uh, and then uh, this obviously uh, this would move uh, into a design phase, and that design phase would consist of you know building out these and designing these necessary components and interactions and interface design frameworks that people like Aaron, et cetera, would go on to use ideally to kind of build and grow the community for IPFS in the mobile space. Um, so uh, we'll go over in the, uh, the intent of the research and the methodology and then what we did and what this helped us find out. And we wanted to look at, like I mentioned before, a user-centered approach to finding the best way to design for IPFS for mobile. So uh, with the combined research and design um, that, you know, they're kind of can't have one without the other, I don't think, to find out what works for users and then go and do that. And instead of uh, kind of working on assumptions, looking at kind of where those needs are and then how we could best address those. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, it's laid out here, the user, uh, sorry, the IPFS mobile design guidelines, they're in Gitbook currently. And then this uh, is also in a GitHub repo, which uh, um, there's the links for and I can send them around again as well. And this also goes to a, a protocol labs Gitbook as well too. So yeah. It's, you, you will have your own, you know, obviously branding and all that among that. So uh, the first thing to to look at is, uh, w you know, what are the considerations for mobile? Because this uh, um, Lytle mentioned before and somebody else did it as well about the browser design guidelines. And that was a distinctly different animal than um, a mobile phone. Uh, so uh, we're looking at this, these, these big differences uh, between mobile browsers and the desktop. They have a lot of different interactions, and then also development is a lot different for mobile than it is for um, desktop as well. And that there's obviously questions around uh, development environments for these. So um, 
when you have kind of this universal platform, which is a browser and you have standards versus this kind of app centric world and, and kind of this push back and forth between using a mobile web and not um, with things with like progressive web apps and that. Um, and then looking into another consideration is a big one um, that I've spoken with a couple of you like Aaron uh, is around battery life and power, you know, and wanted to find out about how much of this it is an issue. So that's another thing we're looking at. So just how, how it works for people. And then uh, the big obvious one is connectivity, bandwidth, signal, that sort of thing. It's, a, it's an obvious issue with connecting because none of this will work out without connection. But then we have these offline issues and kind of what is the syncing? What are people, uh, people's ideas around syncing? And finally, uh, this kind of amalgam of privacy, security, and identity. And it, this is a bit of the elephant in the room, speaking with uh, our or three cohorts because um, nobody wants to talk about it or just kind of wants to put it off. And there's a lot of interesting mix of attitudes around kind of these ideas. So, um, okay. Uh, so yeah, just moving on, uh, we'll kind of talk a bit about the methodology that I used for this. Um, so there's three, uh, a couple parts. Uh, the first, well, two main parts was the first is the mobile survey review. And that was looking at, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second. So we looked at what was out there and what was the previous efforts so we could understand what the landscape was, kind of what we were dealing with, what people have done before. And then we ran a workshop with uh, kind of internal IPFS developers such as Lido um, and with Dietrich. And we're looking at kind of gathering these initial issues, what were the previous experiences with this sort of thing, and looking how we can kind of frame the research from that end of things. Um, in terms of what their concerns were and kind of how that might lead us to which users we should talk to and what and kind of what we might talk to them about. And then we talk to people uh, who, who use or might use IPFS from normal. So this is, we'll get into in a bit, uh, the research interviews and kind of the findings from there. So uh, the first bit is in the application survey is uh, looking at mobile browsers. Now we looked at what people use for content and files on the internet for the phones. And one thing that we found talking to everybody is that a browser on a mobile is still kind of this, this first stop, you know, this one stop shop for information. And also that people interact and share from the browser and then through the OIOS and then vice versa. So it still plays an extreme role, even though the apps are, you know, quite prevalent in use. Yeah. Um, oops, sorry, one second. And then also when I highlight the development issues, again, with this kind of back and forth between being app-centric, people developing apps, and people kind of interacting and knowing kind of what you can do on a phone through an app, and then versus, you know, kind of a more wide open and standard universal platform like a browser. Um, and kind of how these interactions differ. And then, and then following that, um, we looked at kind of different uh, mobile sharing interactions in particular, we looked at sharing photos. Now we're interested in looking at how users right now share files and because it's kind of easy to understand it's and everyone we talked to did it. They shared a file of some sort. Now we chose images because this is a common pattern and then also it was one they all did and it was differs from other media in that, for instance, audio and video and stuff like that because they were actually moving or sharing or copying the actual file rather than sending links, which seems to be the more the most prevalent pattern on mobile with um, that sort of medium like audio and video and that thing. Um, and we wanted to do this looking at that kind of those patterns um, and I can show you one real quick um, for Android. So there's deeper investigation how one kind of goes to a photo shares through that. And there's also for iOS and the same with a browser, but we look, wanted to see where the seams and the interactions were. So we wanted to see kind of what people were up against, what their workarounds were, kind of if this was a natural interaction, kind of to see where the seams are and kind of see where the design and the research might lead with that. Following that, um, we looked at, we did an application survey. So, um, uh, you know, and you might wondering why these bits of focus, why these particular apps, we had, they were chosen first to be stable and available. So ones that were released in um, Android and iOS stores or they were mobile web apps. And we wanted to see what were the previous approaches and under, people's different understandings of PDP 
And we wanted to see that in kind of a broad spectrum. So P2P on mobile has quite a broad spectrum and covers a lot of different things. And that in the kind of big three groupings that we discovered were uh, messaging, um, community or posting, which is highly related to messaging, and then file sharing. And then some of them, as, as we'll learn, kind of crossover as well a lot too, which is interesting. And the apps we covered, and again, uh, you're free to uh, read in more de depth in the investigations here and the findings for each of them in particular, uh, were Manyverse. Uh, so that uh, uses Scuttlebutt communications and it's, you can run offline and online. And it's generally kind of a chat-based app. So it generally fits into the messaging and posting. ShareDrop, uh, which is uh, a web app, which is um, for kind of anonymous file sharing peer-to-peer. Um, doesn't require accounts, so that fits into file sharing. Status, which is a blockchain app, which is, you know, you can use messaging and posting, but you can run dApps within that. Um, Frostwire, uh, which is a torrent app, so it's a torrent application. It's um, Android only, so it's a stable release. We tested it fairly well. Um, and uTorrent Mobile, which is another torrent one. And then Haven, which uh, actually uses IPFS to, uh, and runs on the OpenBazaar peer-to-peer network. And then um, finally, Fairdrop, which is also another file, uh, web-based uh, file transfer app. Um, now, and then after that, we looked at, well, what were the features? And again, I kind of brought, I, we broke it into these three groups of messaging, posting, and file sharing. And then breaking it down into what kind of had the, the same broad spectrum of features in that for each of them across the board and what didn't. And, so for instance, some, some sort of features came out immediately already, which is uh, showing, you know, uh, let's say where some were, sorry, uh, some shared both uh, how they handled messages, others didn't, and then this led to a further deeper study, which was the interaction study. Now in the interaction study, we are showing, uh, for instance, that showing status uh, was interesting in particular because uh, how it was shown wasn't consistent at all. Or for instance, how accounts were handled, or let's say identity was very different from category to category, and from app to app. Um, and there's no real good way of handling identity, it seems, beyond the email and password, it looks like, in terms of ease of use. And again, we can see there's um, some were using private keys without recovery, some had not. Um, yeah, there's lots of interesting things around logging in and out, and some didn't allow you to log out. Um, and then finally, kind of uh, confirmations and notifications. So looking at how the user is, understands kind of what is happening, and how that these different apps and platforms provided them, well, this essentially a layer of comfort, or you know, this, this understanding of what's going on. And then finally, handling media. So we, we talked about photos before, but as we'll see before here, and then you're, you're free to check in in greater depth in, in terms of having a media player, what things they supported. Um, and in terms of the findings, um, it, does anybody have any questions so far? Should we keep them to the end? Um, any, feel free to chime in if you like. No? It's all good? Tell us about, about carry on and we can do oh, the okay, more yeah. together. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. We, we are speaking behind your back in the chat. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, I keep on seeing a flash. Okay, yeah. All right, no problem. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the, the findings were kind of varied and some, I guess you would say, uh, uns uh, unexpected things happened. So, um, one thing that was common through most of them, there was lots, perhaps too much onboarding information a lot of times. So, it was great that they were showing that there was no shortage of explaining the benefits of these particular apps. But, it maybe could have been too much. So this is one thing to, to bear in mind in the mobile platform is uh, reading's difficult. If smaller screen sizes, generally less time. So these sorts of issues are interesting in terms of the findings across the board. Um, keys are difficult to manage. You know, when you tell somebody they have a 48 word or whatever it is, seed <laughs> string of words that they need to save somewhere else or it all goes away. That's, things like this are difficult to deal with. Um, so. Another thing to bear in mind, so there's this, always this trade-off versus security versus usability. Kind of that highlights that. Um, torrent apps were really good at showing what was going on, um, something I wouldn't suspect necessarily, but in terms of the status of the downloads, peers connected, that sort of thing, they generally handled that quite well. 
Um, messaging wasn't very consistent, especially in terms of permissions and that sort of thing. So a lot of apps, you could just follow a person and then send them a photo, which is, you know, could lead to problems, for instance. Um, and then found a couple of examples in the chat and community apps, you know, that, that you that you could just again follow that there wasn't any sort of authentications you could you couldn't reject somebody necessarily so there's a kind of breaks pattern with a lot of chat apps where you can block and then you can kind of users can provide these sort of safety layers with themselves and finally with the file share apps uh, share drop and fair drop they were the simplest to use but still had patterns of use uh, for instance QR codes uh, that might be uncommon in this sort of thing, but interesting because it kind of reflects other mobile sharing patterns. So WhatsApp, for instance, authenticates with QR codes. Uh, a lot of blockchain dApps and that they, you know, they use QR codes to to initiate the transfer. So uh, that was really interesting as well too. Um, and then moving into the second section. So after that, looking at all the kind of like, let's say the, at, the the broader landscape, you know, we moved into the actual use research. Now. Um, as I mentioned before, we ran a workshop before uh, with, that I led myself and then looking at kind of where, how to frame this, right? And that workshop led in and then, you know, looking through materials, the going through the understandings from the application, you know, looking at the application survey. We were looking at kind of, we needed to start somewhere. So we kind of came with a broad set of, uh, well, assumptions, you know, and you know, to start this inquiry and to frame this user research. Uh, for example, uh, people use mobile phones differently than on the desktop. That was an assumption. That's not necessarily a hypothesis. That isn't something we wanted to prove, but this is just a way to kind of lead the questioning, the conversation around things. Uh, another example is uh, infrastructural services on mobile devices, such as battery life and bandwidth, are essential to all users. You know, for instance, we this was part of the conversation with all three cohorts of users, but then we found that it wasn't so simple. So again, this is more of the way to start the conversation rather than something to prove or disprove. Um, and yeah, let's just move on to the interviews really. So uh, as I mentioned, we had three groups, um, uh, the first of which was experts, um, early, what we're calling early adopters, and then potential users. Uh, so the first group, the, the experts, uh, these people all had experience with IPF or similar, um, for example, DAT technologies. Uh, one of them's here right now on the call. Uh, and we wanted to find insights into these deep niches, for instance, offline. And that was kind of, again, we're talking about looking for the seams in use and interaction and looking for these edges to find out what might be in the middle for people. Uh, so some of the key findings for that. Um, and kind of click into there and kind of look at that. Uh, the, the rough groupings are perception and adoption, and then data and sharing. And within that, uh, for instance, one of the things that was interesting that came up was that battery life was assumed to be important to users. Um, that, that was true, that speaking to the, the other users and their early adopters, but it wasn't so simple. So their understanding of power and their worries about power were, or rather batteries uh, were were quite different or nuanced, I guess you could say. And then identity, that it, it's hard to explain, but it has, but there's many different ways of handling it. And then another thing that came out on, as well is, is this idea of airdrop as this kind of gold standard. And that came up with a, all the other, uh, many of the other studies in the cohorts as well too. Um, and then the next group, uh, we can just click back here, uh, were the early adopters. Now the early adopters are, we have or were people who were working in advanced technology or related fields. So for instance, uh, health data and security or maybe blockchain related things. And so it's not necessarily directly within this P2P field, but they all had kind of tangential fields that they're working in. And then they also had a user focus as well too. Now within the, the, the early adopters, again, because they had a user focus, um, there was, again, a lot of kind of commentary about the interface and interactions and users that, uh, rather issues that users specifically might have around their kind of use. And then around data and security came up a lot of times. Uh, one thing that was interesting was uh, around notifications and status came up a lot and, you know, telling the user what is going on and especially around something important that's going on, but then not being overwhelming about it. So. Uh, this came up in the application survey, how, how it's different, how the different notifications and kind of, the, for instance, syncing is something syncing, is it not syncing? There's a lot of different approaches to this, but it's quite important. And th this came out a lot in the conversations around cloud services. 
as well too. And again, identity, logging out, all these sorts of issues because it's difficult, right? And it's, and I guess that this cohort might have had more empathy with some like less technologically experienced users as well. And there didn't seem to be any kind of single silver bullet sort of thing besides single sign on, but that has its own difficulties as well too. Um, and then finally, this, this notion of cloud services about kind of that, it's a fact that all, every single person we used, we talked to used either Google Drive or Dropbox or any, any of the other numbers of others, but there, every single one was sort of apprehensive about it, <laughs> which is really interesting. And then uh, another, th uh, another key finding that I thought was personally fascinating, especially from a design standpoint, is that um, file management is difficult. So you know there it's not just about the syncing it's all about the organization and how you're viewing what, what do i have who has it that sort of thing and then finally the last group um was uh potential users and they were chosen from a spread across europe and africa so there's uh three groups in each and covering well generally all corners of each continent really and all had to not have anything to do with software development. <laughs> For instance, that was the first requirement. And they had all used P2P, which was usually torrents in most cases, and cloud services. So we can kind of compare these experiences. Um, some of the key findings from them, uh, let me click there as well, um, was media was a huge focus of their use um, around files. That, that wasn't, I guess, not too strange to understand, but it was good to have that verified with this particular group. And all understood P2P and actually liked the idea, but didn't really know what they would use it for besides torrents. So that was kind of, how do we bridge that kind of gap, right? In that the idea is quite easy to explain, especially compared to things that are kind of related, let's say blockchain, which is difficult to explain, but to kind of potentially a non-technical user that it's quite easy to get it. One computer connects to another. Um, and then how privacy is understood varies. And we kind of had this assumption that in different parts of the world that privacy has different kind of approaches, different understandings. Um, but it's interesting that it's how nuanced it is. So uh, for instance, uh, some of the people in Africa we talked to were worried about privacy, whereas some people assume that they're not. Um, and vice versa. So it was quite interesting, the, 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 the nuances. But in general, I think one of the things that kept on coming up was the concern about it, but that it just, it's just being, it's difficult. <laughs> so it's something that's just kind of put off. And so again, these sorts of things that we're kind of teasing out of these interviews uh, really will feed into this kind of development of design guidelines. And kind of that's summarized in here in the findings. Um, and and there's been a lot of work around uh, for users by, by people like Dropbox, by Apple with AirDrop and with Google, with Google Drive. So this is, they've done a ton of work and these are longstanding things that people have a lot of experience and a, more importantly, a lot of comfort with. But it's a sort of weird ambivalent comfort as well too, that they see it as something that's stable and dependable. But then there's also sort of this notion or this apprehension around is this service still gonna be around a year? Do I actually trust them with this many files? Like, I believe that it'll still be there because it's a big dependable company. Um, and this idea about backup is a big deal that it, it will be safe up there, you know? And, and who has the file? I think that this is an interesting thing talking to different people about this, you know, this assumption, does it matter where the file actually is as long as it's safe? So this is something that came up a lot in these conversations as well too. And, and again, like I said before, another interesting things kind of in these groups, sorry, I should have mentioned there's, these are broken off into these three groups, cloud services, syncing and usability and awareness, and then finally security and identity, which has come up again and again, this idea of security and identity. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, kind of uh, at, the, at the beginning that this idea of battery and signal, that it's all over the place, the kind of attitudes and approaches to it. And uh, a lot of things were kind of disproven for myself, personal assumption that battery would be a bigger deal um, in certain parts of the world and it wasn't necessarily. But signal was, but what signals thought of and people's relative, I guess, acceptance of how, what's good and what isn't is also quite relative. So that's really interesting to, to kind of find and hear these things and then, you know, kind of see where to design from there, you know, to. A, well, to see how you can design across the board for these sorts of things, really. And then finally, um, as I believe I might have mentioned before, privacy is understood differently in different contexts. And that's not just geographically at all. It's many times between personal and work. So that people are 
I wouldn't say paranoid necessarily, but concerned in different ways for different stuff. So a lot of it has to do with just people's lives rather than necessarily where they live, although that has and definitely has an influence as well. Um, and then finally, we took all of this, uh, so this, uh, this work around the applications, seeing what work has been done out there before, and then the user research and kind of people's attitudes, people's understandings, things, people's opinions on what could or should be, and then kind of developing this, well, this design strategy, which would feed into uh, the design phase. And ultimately, this is all about growing the user base. Um, IPFS is at a really interesting position um, because it's, let's say, not as prevalent in the mobile sphere as a lot of other solutions, but maybe it can start something new with something that really works for people. Um, and of course, mobile is the way to mass adoption. You know, yeah, everybody's seen the graphs where it's just overtaking desktop use, especially in um, yeah, the emerging markets and that. Um, and, and, but there is this need to translate research into design and these guidelines, which will lead to more and more user-focused development. Um, and so from this, all of the findings uh, prior with uh, looking at different applications and you know, speaking with people in those three different cohorts, we've kind of constructed these key design questions. And again, these aren't, these aren't hypotheses necessarily to be proven, but ways to, I guess, talk through or have the conversation through design to look at how we can address some of these issues. Um, what, uh, some of them are, for instance, uh, how might we create seamless interactions from device to device, you know, and well, again, what does seamless mean, right? And what's acceptable for people, you know, what's kind of where are those breaks that are acceptable, where are not? Um, again, and how can IPFS be better, not just as good as what's out there, for example, with file management? Um, that's an, a terribly interesting design case. And notifications and status are going to have to have special attention paid to them. That seems quite evident. But um, because, you know, it's there's this way to reduce cognitive load. But again, that makes a better experience is if, if IPFS for mobile handles notifications and status and all these sorts of things and settings better than, let's say, existing cloud services, then it would give it a distinct advantage, for instance. And a lot of these things add up to how we can not only make things better, but and not as hard, but actually better, you know, looking for these little seams, these little things that can be addressed across the board, really. And so what next is largely about taking all of this and designing the interaction and the components that go into them for other people to use and iterate on, really. And, you know, feeding that back into guidelines and building a community of, well, design and research practice around this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's it for me, really. Um, I'm happy to take questions, address any concerns, or yeah, if anybody has any comments. Anyone? Yeah, Jim, if thanks, you want to. Thanks for presenting this. Oh, no worries. Happy to. I was just going to say, you might want to take a quick scroll through the chat and see if there's anything you wanted oh, to comment yeah, on sure. in there. It was quite active <laughs> I mean, while you were going. Not yeah, direct, I haven't had a not chance to. Questions, so lots of chatter, which is awesome. That okay, yeah. Bringing in their own, um, their own experiences. Right. I really, I really appreciated that you were looking at kind of resource constraints because at offline camp, when I hear stories from more like developing world, rural healthcare kind of scenarios, we always it, it's brought to light all of the resources that we take for granted in our urban settings here, uh, mm -hmm. that they're all kind of interplaying. And different people value different, you know, battery life versus this versus that differently based on their circumstances. So that's right. I think uh, an interesting note on that to to further that kind of line of thinking, Terry, would be uh, uh, people. I guess in I, I used to, I lived in London for a long time, where offline is is a big deal because you're inside a lot potentially, or you're underground. That you're literally underground <laughs> where you don't have signals. So. And people don't necessarily take that into account until you start talking about the things like public transport and trains and planes and that sort of thing. And it's, it's not necessarily a geographic question at all too. So there's like these little weird situations that all of us run into, you know, where this online, offline, and, and it's also like data costs for a lot of people. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, in certain regions or certain parts of the world that, you know, data on LTE or whatever might cost a lot and like for other people, you know, so there's, a teenager in London has to pay in their minds. That's a lot of money, you know, for the, to pay for, you know, X amount of data per month too. Yeah. I think in relation to that, Jim, uh, that um, the, the problem in, in London 
will probably get sold by uh, by the uh, ever growing market of telecommunications. Yeah, I so agree. Like, yeah, yeah. You have an issue of in connectivity when you get to the sub. It will probably get fixed by putting a lot, probably a, a couple of millions of dollars somewhere to to add bigger pipes and uh, put mm -hmm. longer cables and. Uh, that's that's not going to be an issue. I think uh, for for the deep web, uh, so so it, I, I think it's a very good issue to do offline first, as Terry uh, was uh, uh, is focused on and it has mentioned many times mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, seamless to exist. Uh, but um, well, I I I, I wanted to. Uh, bring you a few things in relation to the well I, I i would say you can scroll through the <laughs> through the chat yeah yeah uh, sorry i, I am scrolling through the chat yeah uh, um, yeah i mean it's it's again these things are relative so people's understanding of safety and security is relative but again a teenager in london if they can't get to spotify that's the end of the world for them potentially but it might not be the you know as drastic as that they have no communication whatsoever but I mean these issues affect a lot of people so that, I guess that's just what I was trying to say that it's offline isn't just a, a problem in certain markets that's, that's definitely it. we all we all encounter it in very different ways from each other yeah um, so one question which I apologize if I kind of miss this in the intro but yeah. when we talk about this like IPFS on mobile mm -hmm. are we is Protocol Labs about to build a product called IPFS on mobile, or are we creating a body of research that Textile or anyone else in the community can kind of reference as they build user-facing things that they want accessible on mobile? I, I can take that one. This okay. is definitely this is definitely to be able to 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 inform the ecosystem as a whole. Um, some of this we can use to inform our protocol design decisions. Uh, as, as we're making decisions around high and low watermarks, around like wh whether to invest in say uh, automation and, and regression testing for things like power consumption for given basic operations of our network protocols, that's definitely where it can help help us from a protocol design standpoint. Um, from ecosystem standpoint, I see this as a, uh, think about how many native or mobile apps exist today and how those grew over, over time and how, how rapidly they actually grew from 2006 to 2010. Uh, uh, how do we, and we're in a situation now with um, a, a million terrible apps, uh, apps that like the, the, where the user, the user commitment, like we did research at Mozilla that showed that people are very reticent to install a native app at all. How do you get people over that app install barrier? Uh, with P2P, it's even higher, that barrier, if the user knows enough to know it's P2P maybe. But for me, this is about uh, important in that it can help the next 10,000 apps that are written on top of, of IPFS or DOT or Scuttlebutt or WebTorrent can help the next 10,000 apps to have a base of learning, uh, a set of basic recommendations, uh, things to look at. Not exhaustive, not, not you know, comp totally comprehensive yet, but at least something to start working with and, and something where when they're coming to our documentation website or, um, you know, I've talked to the DOT folks, they have um, Simply Secure doing a project around decentralization UX generally. Um, that, that our ecosystem, our communities are sharing information and best practices about what works, what doesn't work, especially these things that vary at the, at the glass, right? Things like notification frequency, uh, how much to show, um, like, you know, just showing, showing peer count is maybe a signal of one part of your connectivity, but doesn't necessarily say something about the quality of those connections. How do we communicate these more nuanced and complex concepts to, to users uh, as we're building the next 10,000 apps? Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. I stopped your share just so we can see everybody. Yeah, no, it's bigger on the recording. <laughs> yeah, and stuff. yeah I, I was gonna one of, one of the I did manage to catch Nico your question about uh, rural versus urban. Uh, all of the people that I spoke with actually were in urban context, so um, in Africa as well too, which is in Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya. So all of them were, yeah, they, they were in cities. So, um, but you do bring so, up a good uh, And also, yeah. Uh, so uh, in relation to that, Jim, uh, 
uh, South Africa and Kenya are the wealthiest countries in, in Africa. Yeah, also true. Yeah, Nigeria is not. Yeah. Uh, so uh, your your sample might be biased, I would say, if you I want agree. to have yeah, some. It's, a, it's also a small sample, but um, finding users um, to find users to do this is is quite difficult. So. Uh, we are quite lucky to get those people, to be honest. Uh, and so, but yeah, definitely would love to continue study with different places. Um, in the past, I've done field work in Rwanda and I tried to get people there, um, but I couldn't. Um, so it, it'd be great for, to for, talk. Yeah, for further people. work, may, maybe Nico has, a, has people who'd be interested in doing interviews if we wanted to do uh, further yeah. research. We have a very extensive network of communities with, that, that we work with. Uh, I think that what we need to, uh, uh, that they would be eager to participate if they see mm -hmm. value that will come out of it. Like if we, yeah. so if, uh, for me, though I have been joining these meetings and I, they have been very informative, I haven't uh, uh, got my mind around uh, how much uh, IPFS is interested in those uh, population groups, right? That, that are the ones that we are very much focused. Uh, so I, I'm not interested in putting uh, decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer technologies on, on, on top of those that are already connected. Those, it, it's an interesting problem. It's not a problem that we are focused on. The ones that we are focused on are those that are, are, are yet to be connected that will eventually be connected, but will get that, that, that internet that we have built for them, in a way, because we are not putting them much in the driver's seat in, the, in relationship with the, in relation with the network that, uh, that they use. Uh, we are bringing that to them, in a way. Um, so our job is to shift that conversation, so to put it on their hands, and to allow them to build their infrastructure. Uh, so as long as IPFS is willing to work on that area closer, uh, we are more than happy to contribute to that uh, uh, liaison. Even aside from user research, I'd be super interested in how those community directed and community designed networks operate because we can do things like add those into our, into our test scenarios. So we mm -hmm. want to understand how IPFS performs in infrastructure that's community designed, community run. Uh, I talked I, with I Althea talk Project about, about this. Uh, and I would love to be able to have the performance characteristics of those networks so that we can make sure, like we can add that to our list of like, make sure that IPFS operates for these given basic scenarios in these, in those, uh, in, you know, dodgy, like it's designed kind of from the ground up already for things like dodgy networks. But I feel like the areas that, that we talked about here, bandwidth consumption, power consumption, those are the areas where it's not both not optimized and tuned, or there's really big unknowns about how it operates. So having the, even a, a description of the conditions of community design networks, like a community LTE network, um, what is tower strength, what is throughput, what is available bandwidth, out, even hours per day, like if people are extend, on, a, on extended periods, like we found in Brazil, people do three hour or four hour train rides. So their power and bandwidth needs for large chunks of the day are very different. So even abstract information like that would be helpful for designing test scenarios. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, one example I came across in the interviews was um, the, uh, the one guy had two phones. No, sorry, he had four phones and two SIMs in each. So, uh, <laughs> which is just that you're not only dealing with different networks, but it was never the same connection on any of them at any given time, right? And then so you have this, God, like a cascading level of different signals and then battery, which is on which SIM for which network and what is what network strength at different times. So it's really fascinating and requires, yeah, probably definitely more kind of exploration of these sorts of use cases. On one sense, it's fascinating. And I agree, it's fascinating. I, I, when I saw it, I, I, I've been in 30 countries or so, uh, the, most of them say Global South. So that those scenarios have come up. So, but also it's in, impressive. Like, why do people need to get into that? Mm -hmm. It's because the, the conditions are so bad, so low, yeah, so yeah. Uh, that they need to have multiple sims to find the best deal in each sim to do the call that it gets. It's drain. It drains their income the less. 
<laughs> and and in order in order to do that, they need multiple. Fo it's terrible. Uh, so uh, we need to think about those scenarios too. Definitely. Yeah, like I, I always think about when we spin up seven hundred peers. You know, like I, whenever I see like seven hundred peers showing up in my uh, browser for for uh, IPFS or any you know P2P networks. Like they're gathering peers is a way, the more peers, the better chance your request will be fulfilled quickly. And that's the math that's been done by the designers at the protocol level. So when you think about that, where every single byte that you transfer is eating the money that people bought to be able to get three megabits bonus top up on their plan that week, it, the, the math doesn't work out at all, right? Like the, the, the mo more peers as an architectural design choice falls on it on his face immediately for that whole class of users which is yeah, a billion or two people around the world also one, uh, sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say there's kind of this like third scenario that i'd be curious to learn more about see what kind of appetite people have for the idea because it you know there's either like not p2p and not ipfs like some centralized uh, proprietary system, or there's like this idea of IPFS on mobile. But then the third thing, which I think we're very curious about at Textile right now, is the idea of like designating a some sort of always online node as your representative. It's not on your phone, but it's something that your phone can communicate with whenever it needs uh -huh. to. And that could live kind of like, I don't know, on your home network, on your router, maybe uh, a trusted third party uh, hosted service that you trust, that you sign up for, I don't know. But um, yeah, just this idea of kind of, uh, you know, my phone's not online all the time. It's, it's hard to run a full node on my phone. It's expensive or it needs a lot of battery or whatever. So I'm gonna delegate a lot of the responsibility for my data to this trusted node that lives somewhere. And this isn't something that exists, so it's very com commonly, so it's not something that users are just gonna like tell you about, but it's something that we are curious about, you know, designing and, and supporting and seeing how it can work. And, and um, so. I'm interested in that. <laughs> so yeah. uh, uh, we, from the, from the Liber Router project, uh, one of the things that we see, like the Liber Router is this thing that, that you put on, the, on your roof, in the roof of your house or in the window of your building or whatever, that connects you with others within your network. Let's say very similar to, maybe you have heard of NYC Mesh or Valtia or other uh, Mesh networks, but it is uh, geek free and not focused on crypto. So you might not have seen it uh, around your corner, but you can already have it if you want, Libre router top. Anyway, um, you have it in your roof, but then you are inside your house and the connectivity between your roof and your house is tricky because well, you have a, probably a thin roof or, a, or you're far from the roof. Um, so what we usually do is we run a cable, an ethernet cable from the roof to the house, and then you, we put a, an in, an inside your house, you put an access point. A wire, a, a any wireless access point to give you connectivity within your house and connect you to the other members of the network. What we want to do is for that router to become your family hub. Uh, and that family hub will play multiple roles, will give you access to the community network, will provide you with a, let's say, like a, a, a set top box experience like a, an, a smart tv experience for those families that don't have uh, a, a computer readily available so there's a fixed com computer all the time in your com in your house and that's a, that's relevant because in some countries where computers are not a thing and they only have one phone the one that has the phone is the man so women in general don't have access to computers when there's only one computer house. So by, by tying the computer to the, house, to the home, when the man leaves the house, the, the woman gets access to the computer. Uh, so there's a gender component there. And then it also acts as a permanent peer-to-peer -peer actor in the, in the mesh network. So the phone is still a, 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 no, a member of the, net, of the network, but 
your own node is your own replica of your of your peer to peer resources so whenever you get offline or even if you are online but you want to have it uh, a content more readily available for others you can push it to your router to your home hub and the same could happen by pushing it to the router the router could the, the infrastructure the libre router could also be one uh, I, as I was saying in the chat, as, like the CDN, you know, like the a content delivery network. Uh, like the, the network could already have that content and have it readily available for others, even if the members of the network are not around. So if you are interested in digging into that, we are also interested. Wonderful, yeah, that sounds great. I, I was gonna say a lot of these situations uh, in terms of user-centered design are, I guess what you call they they call it uh, extreme users. Um, so, but the, the the great thing is about it. If you explore these kind of edges of things, then you you always come to or you generally come to like a more happy middle. And a lot of what you're talking about, Nico, that would work in many places, not just you know that these sorts of things around connecting to the roof or to the building and then having your own router or your own sorts of hubs. Um, yeah, this works for a lot of people as well, too. So and it's, it's about kind of learning from these different examples and translating that to, to something that works across a, broader, a broad spectrum of people. Um, Aaron, I was going to mention uh, what you mentioned before about this on, always, like, you basically, it's like an outsourced node, I guess you, you could call it, or something like that. That there is a bunch of torrent services that do something similar to this, so that you they do the downloads and then they manage it up there, and then you, you know, you have the account. Yeah. The search is done somewhere else. There's one called Puts.io is one, uh, is in Turkey. Uh, but it's yeah. So these services are really interesting, and there is some movement. It looks to be that these this is developing more and more as a field. So uh, yeah, sounds like it definitely could work. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? This may be more a question for Dietrich and Lytle, I'm not sure, but okay. to what extent do the relationships that we negotiate get harder when we're talking about mobile? So the two of you spend a lot of time talking to like web browsers and figuring out interoperability. Is there a bigger hurdle in the mobile space than there is in other places? Or is it easy because everybody's being forced to actually secretly use WebKit and they're all the same, or I don't know. Uh, it it yeah, it really it really depends. iOS everybody has their hands tied behind their back. Uh, there are very few ways to punch through, um, if on the web browser anyway. Uh, you know, Aaron could probably speak more to what you know things like Textile have done on iOS specifically to find what the optimal balance between you know performance and execution uh, and how they're implementing things like crypto there. Um, but from the from the web perspective, uh, even even browsers that are um, browsers that are shipping, for example, on Chromium rendering engine base, but shipping on Android, uh, also don't have things like extension infrastructure. So it's very hard to add things like P2P lower level P2P network architectures without either bundling in the full node using uh, centralized gateways or uh, doing all the kind of heavy lifting themselves. Um, so we're trying to crack open these things here and there where we have the opportunity to, and we think there's some leverage to be had. Um, there's some of the, some of our, our browsers work, work, working with are very interested in those opportunities, um, but it really depends on it depends on what what is available to to even that that player to even that software vendor, um, and and where they're where they're deploying to. I, iOS just super hard in some ways. Um, even when you have access to sometimes more advanced network stacks, like they have things like um, uh, you know MDNS and some of their underlying APIs for that enable some P2P functionality already built into the OS stack and it's very and it's solid, like it works well, uh, but it doesn't interoperate with other platforms. And it also you can't uh, you are at a distance from those APIs. Uh, you can't implement the really lower level nuts and bolts that we use both for crypto and um, for some of our like with P2P network architecture stuff. So it's, it's really challenging. Uh, you, you, sh you would be interested to get in touch with uh, Andres Staltz from Manyverse. He has just ported Manyverse to iOS. Of course, it's not the same problem because uh, I don't, so it's, um, 
Maniverse doesn't, Scuttlebutt doesn't do like intensive uh, crypto activities, uh, but he, it's working. So you should try it out at least. Well, yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've talked to him before. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see like uh, Textile's done a bunch of work and Birdie did a bunch of work as well on iOS. Uh, you know, utilizing the, the native stack. Birdie's recent post about how to get Android and iOS interoperating uh, over DLE and Wi-Fi Direct is, is kind of fascinating and really speaks to the level of technical challenge there. Um, if you pick one, one deployment channel or platform like iOS, uh, it's easier to interoperate, uh, getting interoperability in those lower level hardware network ability and uh, um, building interoperable standards on top of that is really challenging. Um, I'm interested to see how Maniverse uh, works between Android and iOS. Uh, for example, the planetary Scuttlebutt uh, app doesn't work with any other Scuttlebutt apps, and it's iOS only, and they're like, oh, we'll figure that out later, right? It's like, let's do iOS first, and then we'll figure out the other th 2 billion mobile users later, right? Uh, the ones that have less money. Um, and it, so I'm interested to see what the interoperability story there is, or if it's just like have to hit the network, the cloud, to be able to connect or not. So just a time check, we have two minutes left and we wanted to save some time for brainstorming on future topics. Do we have anything incredibly pressing on this topic that someone feels the need to get there? One last question. Okay. Thank you so much, Jim, for sharing that. Yeah, no, no. Research no, no, and no plants, that's yeah. really awesome. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks. Everyone. So I will just uh, take a few notes. Let's see. Well, Lyle will take a few notes. What do people have for ideas? What are related concepts in the local and offline collaboration space that you hope we can explore in future discussions or people who are building cool things that we should invite to present or those kinds of things? or anything about sort of the structure of this meeting that isn't working well for you. I, I'd love to hear more from, from Nico or, is it, you know, what, what did you present on last time, Nico? Was it the types of local community infrastructure, telco infrastructure that you were talking about earlier? earlier? So I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, uh, I have other, uh, yes. So I, I'm happy to, to bring people to the conversation. Uh, again, I, I would, I would, uh, uh, I would also like to hear more about the uh, IPFS uh, offline or global south strategy, if there is any. Um, and uh, oh, what well, I had an idea, but it left it slip in slip my mind, so it will come. The past presentation was about Libre Router, Dietrich. So you'll be able to find that recording on our YouTube channel and. The notes in this in the same document. That's great. Uh, did we have uh, someone from QX project in the past? I was not on every call ever. However, QX, from... yeah, QX is a project for um, creating a compressed snapshots of things like media wiki pages that includes wikipedia but also like all the dictionaries uh, stack overflow project gutenberg um, and we are collaborating with kiwix around putting those snapshots on ipfs the uh, distributed wikipedia mirror that we have right now is basically an unpacked snapshot created by the kiwix project and we are looking into ways of one putting zim files on ipfs so ipfs could act as a distribution network for those uh, snapshots and using them directly from ipfs so that way only like a single person in a classroom would have to have that zim and it does not matter if that's teacher or one of students or something like that and it would be immediately available. Um, and at the same time, we are also looking into uh, a web-based reader 
So the, those snapshots in compressed form are binary and require specialized reader. However, there's, there's like JavaScript based one. The problem is those snapshots are hundreds of gigabytes in size sometimes. Um, and if we put Zim on IPFS, then you don't need to fetch entire thing. You could fetch just a specific byte range and you don't need the, any fancy APIs in a web browser because JSIPFS or JSIPFS HTTP client already provides all the primitives for, I want this byte range from this CID and you don't need to specify from where. Um, and it, ideally it would work in a web browser. So I think we could have a, at least maybe invite someone from Kiwix to tell us a first part, uh, just tell about the project. Um, and in the future, we probably could also s uh, have a separate one on how we can leverage IPFS or like introduce Kiwix.js if it's a thing. Um, those are my thoughts. Sorry for speaking okay. for. You should type over what I wrote for the name of the company you're talking about, which I'm probably yeah, I was about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I have I just, no idea. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you just type something that that's what you were yeah. saying. Gotcha. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, the, na the name is Kiwix, but I have no idea how to spell it. So yeah, okay. I, just, I, I did reasonably well, notes. considering that's not a word. Um, um, what else? What else? What other topics would you like to hear about on this call? Um, I'm going to I'm going to poke uh, a friend that sets up network infrastructure for refugee camps in Bangladesh. They have to rig all kinds of stuff. Uh, his life is like DNS is 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 the devil is like every is like the ultimate stopper for everything they have to do is yeah. uh, dependency on DNS. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the communication rarely leaves the camp. But it's people in the camp talking to each other. Um, so I, I, I'm going to see if he will come and talk about how they set up infrastructure for these types of like partial closed network where they're mm -hmm. high volume, high bandwidth, but very tiny locality. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I, I was going to mention too, um, you might want to talk to uh, Mike Brenner for Data for Change. He was one of the people I talked to um, in the early adopters category, but um, they do a lot of uh, da data for advocacy work in conflict zones. So um, they've been working on something uh, nominally called a shutdown response kit. So um, because they've, uh, Yemen, it's you know all over the place, and they've gone and they've gone into other places where Lebanon or Lebanon and somewhere else that they were there, and then all of a sudden everything's shut down, and then there's no way for them to respond to this. That it's just it's not the, the lack of connectivity, and but it's unplanned offline, I guess you could say, and how to kind of be able to respond to that when in these kind of well, yeah, something when you're trying to gather data in a conflict zone is extremely difficult to say the least. Um, I was sorry. No, I was thinking in relation to uh, user experience and user interfaces and uh, experience overall. I think uh, uh, Pouch, DB, and Hoodie uh, are two that have been working on this for quite some time and could uh, could uh, enlighten us uh, in relation to how they have approached user-centered design for the area use cases, uh, hospital run being another one. Uh, I guess Terry knows them well from yeah. offline first. Uh, yeah, now, nice. you're, now you're back in my camp with the, the non-DWeb thing, so I feel like I know <laughs> something about. But Dietrich, no. if you you wish, you should wish to try to snag Gregor from the... Yeah, um, also Dale. I know Dale pretty well too from PostDB. Okay. So we could um, get a, a couple yeah, different people probably to speak. Gregor's not at Neighborhoody anymore, but Neighborhoody was involved in the Ebola response as well. So, mm -hmm. with the pouch couch. Um, and then, so the reason I, I mentioned uh, uh, coronavirus, I hope everyone is well, safe, and clean. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, has, uh, <laughs> this has affected uh, everyone, everywhere. So, it's something that uh, affects us all. But the, the people that are least privileged in our surroundings are the, the ones that are more affected by this situation. Um, so I wonder specifically if there is any, uh, so though this is offline and not uh, 
pandemic uh, <laughs> IPFS <laughs> conversation. Next, next uh, Tuesday. Next Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, I wonder. Yeah. I wonder if, if, there, if there was some actions, or if there there, there is some interest in uh, putting energy in uh, how IPFS could contribute to uh, being uh, doing direct action or indirect action, like uh, su supporting those that are doing things like that, or doing things directly, putting energy heads that uh, uh, you have so many heads that are. Uh, smart let's say um, so. <laughs> yeah i will just mention that protocol lab set up a oh is, did the deadline pass a grant program to support people doing work in the space but maybe the deadline passed mm -hmm. i'm not positive oh and definitely okay, good job like, i don't found uh, the link about information yeah we're seeing a lot of stories of ipfs being used for direct action um for yeah. you know both uh, um, or organized and, and also sometimes uh, a little bit under, under the covers and uh, borderline, uh, you know, with local law around data protection and things like that. I have a couple of big stories this week too. So it'd be interesting to talk about what, what, what that means for the project, how, this, how that relates to offline also, I think is really interesting, mm -hmm. uh, how, they, how these data, this data is being transmitted. I mean, just from a, I guess you'd call a, an interaction theoretical sort of standpoint, this, this notion of contact tracing kind of, no, there seems to be a relation between, you know, that they're saying about Bluetooth connections, but maybe there's some sort of thing around there um, and just kind of hops between phones and being, I don't know. And then there was also, I think Dietrich, um, the, the link I sent you before there, there was somebody talking about, um, there's some company in India developing a blockchain way to, um, to do like anonymous uh anonymous contact tracing and they're they're talking about potentially using ipfs as the the kind of data store for it so i'll hold on i'll send i'll put the link in here <laughs> they're meaning the chat uh, Sorry. so something else that i would like to share with you that might be food for future calls <laughs> is we are we will be doing a uh, we are in conversations we, that this would be Liber Router. We, uh, Liber Router will be in, is in conversations with a, a state government. Oh, this is gonna be recorded. Anyway, uh, one state. Uh, um, the, and we, we might be doing a neighborhood size deployment, uh, 1500 families. Uh, so a, neighbor, a, a, a network that is a, a good size network, uh, and I, I imagine uh, that these ideas of embedding peer-to-peer -peer protocols in routers or in this or in network setups, uh, being in this deployment or in future deployments, we can find uh, opportunities to try these ideas out and uh, prototype together and. Um, uh, explore user experiences and uh, um, I wonder if there's something there that we should be exploring that we are not yet exploring. I don't know, Terry or Molly uh, or, or who, but there's something there that sh we should be following up on, maybe. Of your PL people, I'm actually the least connected directly to the IPFS project right now. So they'll do a better job of talking about any of the technical connections, but. I mean, I think there's um, a lot of awesome work that folks like Aaron are doing in kind of looking and experimenting, like just in general, there's tons of people in the ecosystem who've really been pushing mobile forward and, you know, Snaps, snaps to all the people who are identifying some of these problems and, and a chunk of the, the research work that's happening here is also like giving us better feedback loops. So I think it, I would encourage us to look more broadly um, at people who are heads down in this space and can be a part of identifying what we need to do as a, as a project to offer better support. All right. I need to drop in a sec to head to another call, but I just wanted to ask a quick scheduling question. So we are experimenting with 
no meeting Wednesdays <laughs> and it's Wednesday. So just checking as to whether we have another, we can follow up with this offline if we want to, but thinking about another day that would work well for us. Has this time of day been working fairly well for people? We've got our kind of time zone crossover here. Okay. Um, normally we would be meeting on the 20th of April. Is the 21st free for people on the Thursday? The same time? You can try that? Yes, it's me, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, maybe see if a Thursday will work for this one, but I will follow up in our GitHub thread. If anyone hasn't seen it, we use a GitHub issue as the place where we announce what's coming up on this call. So if you want to uh, watch the issue and use email notifications, then you'll actually receive an email from me. It will look like an email from me saying, the call's coming up, you should join us. So um, to find that there. I will copy the notes from our chat and throw them in the notes. And Lionel, I really appreciate you taking care of the notes today. And we will see everybody in May. Thank you so much, Jim, again for sharing. I know. No problem. Thanks, everyone. All right. Cheers. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Bye.